Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello, thanks for joining our webinar on improving home health outcomes using the newest coding updates. My name is Kali, and I'm a member of the marketing team at Access. Access leads the industry with a complete suite of easy to use innovative software, empowering home health, home care, and hospice organizations to grow business while improving care. Mac Legacy, our partner specializes in providing coding, expert consulting, education, and tools for home health and hospice organizations. Today's speakers are Nanette and Mike. Serving in leadership roles for more than 20 years, Nanette has held roles in home care and hospice, including clinical, administrative, consulting, education, and agency startup and development. She currently is a senior coding uh, manager at Mac Legacy. Nanette provides day-to-day -day coding and quality support and also serves as a consultant for quality, audit, and regulatory issues that arise due to the complex and integrated nature of coding. As an OASIS certified physical therapist, Mike gained nearly 20 years of experience working in the field. He then served in a variety of roles for more than a decade at Home Health Gold. Mike was instrumental in helping develop many Home Health Gold analytics related to functional scoring, therapy thresholds, PDGM, and episode management. Mike joined Access in 2018 through the acquisition of Home Health Gold, and he is a senior product manager for our Access certification program, helping design, develop, and create it. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Your phones have been muted, but during that time, you may submit, submit questions through the questions section. Mike will review those and moderate our Q&A. Today's presentation slides are in the handout section of GoToWebinar, and the webinar recording will be available in a follow-up email to all who registered. Welcome, Nanette and Mike. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Kali, and thank you all for joining us, taking time out of your busy days to learn about coding and, and hear what uh, Nanette has to share with us about certainly the updates and how it all weaves together with the rest of your uh, agency operations and practices. So uh, she's certainly the expert and I'm gonna be uh, relatively quiet and moderate your, your questions that uh, come in. We do have a lot of content to cover, so we'll probably not uh, interject too many of those questions into the presentation, but rather we'll get back to you with responses uh, at the conclusion. So uh, again, thank you very much for your time and thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us, Nanette. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with everybody today, and I just wanted to share my screen and show my face and say hello and welcome. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off so I can focus on giving you guys the, the best presentation that I can um, focus on that material. All right. Well, um, today um, we are going to talk about improving your home health outcomes with those coding updates. Um, as was stated earlier, there is a lot of material to cover. Um, there's a good possibility we won't get to all the material, but I didn't want to cut off the coding clinic updates for second and third quarter. So if we don't get to some of that information, I have provided the most uh, updated information at the end relevant uh, to home care and hospice. Um, I do talk pretty fast. So we're going to try to make it through most of the relevant material, and you'll understand as we go through uh, all of this. Again, thank you again for taking um, time um, out of your day um, to be with us to talk um, about this. All right, let me move to the next slide. Um, you'll see our learning outcomes on um, page three, and we're um, certainly going to talk about all of the coding changes, particularly the ones effective for home care that will be effective in October 1st. Um, the other thing that we would like to do is really tie in a little bit more about that plan of care. And so we're going to particularly talk about that at the beginning um, of this webinar. So remember, um, the plan of care or the 485 is a tool that's developed and used by clinicians based on provider documentation and clinician assessment. Complete and accurate coding of those patient diagnoses is the foundation for the care provided and really directs the clinician to prevent any negative events. Um, you know, when we're talking about our outcomes, um, you can only have good outcomes if you have a good plan of care. You can only have a good plan of care if you have done an appropriate job of doing the coding to develop that plan of care based on confirmed diagnosis. So it's, it is vital 
that a couple of things happen, and that's how it's going to affect your affect your outcomes. In addition to um, a monetary outcome, you're going to be uh, looking at efficient coding for timely, accurate reimbursement, taking time to review that documentation thoroughly to determine the correct diagnosis codes and making show, sure those are vital. The use of an official uh, resource is a must. And ongoing education obviously must happen, and you're doing that today to keep up with industry updates. So coding implementation, the codes that we're going to talk about today will be effective um, on Friday, October 1st, um, 2021. And starting in April, um, the um, CDC, the World Health Organization, is going to be um, implementing a biannual update to the coding process. They're going to use the same process, uh, but CMS has recommended that there be a phased in approach and to limit the amount of April 1st coding updates to make it a little bit um, easier on providers. As you can imagine, software vendors, um, you know, all those things that go into implementing new codes and making those available um, now that have to happen twice a year, not just once a year. So this gives us an idea, this next slide, slide um, number six, um, about all of um, the information and, and what the changes were made. So they've added a bunch of slides, they've revised, they've deleted, updated diagnosis coding groups um, for all, uh, all of those. We end up with a total number of diagnosis codes for 72,748. And for those of you who might just have joined us, if you'll be sure that um, know that you can um, get to those handouts um, in the handout section um, of your um, webinar screen at the GoToWebinar site. So um, just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, in addition to all the new codes, we have um, they have actually modified the diagnosis code, the primary clinical group assignments. They moved um, a few of those um, from the uh, musculoskeletal and um, to no primary clinical grouping. They moved one from MMTA GIGU to MMTA other. Um, and they added several primary clinical group assignments. And so as that we go through this presentation, we're going to talk about those and try to provide that information for you. Okay. You'll also notice, um, and I wanted to provide this information um, <clears throat> regarding, uh, we're going to talk a lot about the uh, primary clinical grouping these new codes have fallen under, but what we don't know is how the low or high comorbidity adjustment is going to affect these codes, um, and that's because it's really dependent on the final rule. Um, as, of it, as it stands right now, obviously we're waiting for that to be um, pushed through they've proposed 20 low comorbidity adjustments, and then um, 85, they've increased that number significantly for the high comorbidity adjustments. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the 2022 official guidelines. These can also be known as the documentation guidelines. Um, there were not any coding convention changes, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, but we're going to first go through and talk about the general coding guideline changes, and then we're going to go chapter by chapter to look at um, the ones that are going to affect home care the most. And then at that time, we'll also go through any chapter updates. So the first thing that they talked about in the general coding guidelines is laterality. When laterality is not documented by the patient's provider, medical record documentation from other clinicians can be used to determine this. We've had this for a long time, um, and really using clinical documentation has been okay for about the past year. And what they wanted to make sure is that CMS um, tells us that this should definitely rarely be used. This is not a circumstance when you would use an unspecified code. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, code assignment is based on the documentation by the patient's provider. 
in some of these updates, you'll notice some <clears throat> bolded information. If you see bolded information, that is when they what they actually made changes to <clears throat> in that update. And so those are the actual wording changes. For this particular update, um, they really just cleaned up and they wanted to um, let the provider know when the clinician can document, document something versus the actual um, designated provider. So <clears throat> the coding clinic um, had received a lot of questions regarding, okay, well, what do you mean a clinician and what are you talking about? So in this context, clinicians um, other than the patient's provider refer to the healthcare professionals permitted uh, based on regulatory or accreditation requirements or internal hospital policies to document in a patient's official medical record. So they're just identifying, okay, who can um, determine, um, who can determine coding by clinicians other than that provider. And obviously that would be someone assigned to that case within the agency and moving forward. So some of these exceptions um, are BMI, the depth of the non-pressure chronic ulcers, pressure ulcer stage, coma scale, the stroke scale, social determinants of health, we talked about laterality and blood alcohol level. And so it's just saying that when you're reviewing the record, you might see where a dietitian documents the BMI or a nurse lists the pressure of the ulcer stages. And that's fine, we can docu that, document that information on the medical record. But obviously, if there's conflicting information, we would need to contact the provider. And <clears throat> of course, um, if you know the provider still has to document whether obesity or that they had an alcohol um, issue, the provider still has to document that information and have that um, available before you can document these other exceptions. And of course, these are not ever gonna be listed as primary, but as you see, and we get through this material, you'll note that they're really looking, looking at wanting to go ahead and um, have us document more information to really paint the picture of the episode. All right, <clears throat> this is a new guideline um, in this or new paragraph in this guideline. And <clears throat> it actually says, as stated, and I'm not gonna read every slide to you, but I, I think it's really important to read this slide so that you understand um, how important clear, uh, clear accurate um, provider documentation is to the coding. It says, as stated in the introductory section of these official coding guidelines, a joint effort between the healthcare provider and the coder is essential to achieve complete and accurate documentation, code assignment, and reporting of, reporting of diagnoses and procedures. The importance of consistent, complete documentation in the medical record cannot be um, overemphasized. So without such documentation, accurate coding cannot be achieved. So they're saying that the entire record should be reviewed to determine the specific reason for the encounter and the conditions treated. Now, um, there was a webinar that the coding clinic was involved in and they asked, um, what does, you know, someone asked, what does the entire record mean? Obviously, um, that does not mean the entire chart, um, but the entire documentation for that admission or encounter. So that was good to know. So one of the things that I want you to have a takeaway from that is that if you have old medical records that you're using for a new encounter, um, maybe maybe the records were two months ago and it's a readmission and you've not, um, it, you know, you need to use that documentation because it's all that you have, be sure that, that um, those medical records are located within um, the information of the current provider, um, of the current medical record uh, for that encounter. Uh, you know, so if it's a new admission, make sure you're putting that information there because you know those encounters need to stand alone. Okay, they uh, just provided clarification. Um, it still is interesting to me that there's a an actual code for healthcare encounters in the hurricane aftermath. 
Um, and so they um, wanted to just put clarification here to provide additional information relevant to that encounter by using this code. All right, and we know we must code to the highest level of specificity when supported by the medical record documentation. Um, and that'll become clearer. Um, I've got a little bit of an update of a sneak preview of some things coming and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, we've gone through just some of the general coding guidelines. Let's get into the chapter specific. Um, we're gonna list the new codes and then we're gonna talk through um, the chapter specific updates. All right, so you'll see throughout this presentation, these particular pages um, that list um, the code, it'll list the description, the clinical group and um, comorbidity group. Um, and you'll notice that over on the far right, it says low comorbidity adjustment and all of those say zero. And the reason is, is the final rule, rule is not out yet. So it may have been assigned to a um, comorbidity group, but it's not listed yet what that is. But I wanted you to have these slides because I feel like it gives you a full picture um, of those particular codes. So as we come to these, they're there for your reference, but we're gonna move on through the material. All right, chapter one, certain infectious and parasitic diseases. Um, A79.A2 is a brand new code. Um, and you'll see out to the right of this, it falls in the MMTA infection code. And this code um, is a new code uh, because there's been a rise um, in this disease that is caused primarily from, from um, a couple of different types of ticks. And remember, the CDC does not issue a new code unless it has a reason to, shoot, to do so and the codes reach a certain threshold. And so in 2019, there, this has been on the increase and there was actually 5,655 cases. Um, so just be um, aware of that. So under the infection, infectious disease, um, there was no other codes. Um, they did make a couple of updates to the um, guidelines and in the coding guidelines it says um, it just clarifies instead of AIDS if you see the term or HIV disease um, that that is meaning the same thing. Uh, this is new. Um, they said that if a patient with documented history of HIV disease is currently managed on retroviral medications that you need to assign the B20 code um, for HIV and then Z79899 for other long-term current drug therapy therapy for the antiretroviral medications that they're taking. So be aware of that. Remember also you have to follow whatever your state guidelines are regarding the um, assignment of um, HIV primary or secondary diagnosis. All right, now <clears throat> remember, um, I, and I don't quite fully understand why they did this, but <clears throat> chapter one, and um, they've also identified U071, which we know is COVID, and their U099 is a new code, and it's for post-COVID syndrome, and the code itself actually falls into chapter 22, but the guidelines regarding that chapter, I guess because it relates to infectious disease, they've actually put it um, in chapter one. And so they made several updates and told you where to reference if a patient with COVID has sepsis or they were pregnant or they were newborn or it was the cause of a lung transplant. Um, in addition to that, they um, have added some additional information for signs and symptoms without a definitive diagnosis of COVID. Um, they want you to assign these codes. And so um, when we get to that section, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what defines a code as acute, um, acute cough or uh, some other type of code that they wanted to make sure and they've defined different levels of acute cough, chronic cough, and what that means um, because of COVID. You'll find a lot of the codes that we're going to talk about inherently or um, kind of in a um, offhanded way in some way relate, a lot of them relate to COVID. Um, so that's definitely been been interesting. 
All right. This slide here just talked about um, updates within that chapter specific guideline um, regarding an actual um, physician visit. So it doesn't apply to us. So regarding multi-inflammatory syndrome, which is something that they have seen, obviously that causes um, a lot of the, the acute issues um, with COVID. Um, if an individual with a history of COVID-19 develops this, then you're gonna assign that M3581 primary and the U099 post-COVID condition um, as a secondary code. So U099 is a manifestation code and would never be coded as primary. My concern is, however, if you're trying to follow PDGM guidelines and you get a code um, that falls within that category, um, it's gonna be a little difficult because a lot of them fall into the unspecified codes. They added some information also in chapter one regarding a post-COVID condition um, and what to do if um, it was a late effect. And they were just saying U099 should not be assigned for a manifestation of an active COVID-19. However, there is an exception in this last paragraph that let's say you have chronic respiratory failure as a late effect or um, a sequela of the post-COVID, then you, then you then get reinfected with an active COVID case that you would be able to use that code. All right, moving on to chapter two, neoplasms. Um, there are two new neoplasm codes, one for malignant neoplasm of bilateral ovaries and the second for secondary malignant neoplasm of bilateral ovaries. Um, both of these codes fall in the MMTA infection uh, category, which is infectious disease, neoplasms, and blood forming diseases. So that is that uh, when you see MMTA infect, it's talking about all of those categories. And this just gives us the option when you're coding neoplasm codes that you don't have to code the right ovary and the left ovary individual, individually. The third code that is a new code is C84.7A. And the main issue, um, this is a brand new code, um, and they found an increased incidence of um, lymphoma-related breast cancer, uh, particularly in breast implants with um, textured surface implants versus those smooth implants. And again, remember, it has to meet a certain uh, a certain um, number of cases before they will issue a new code. Um, the main issue to know is that if you do have a patient you're coding regarding this, that you're not going to use a complication code of a breast implant, that you're actually going to use this particular code. And our chapter uh, coding guidelines um, lines that out for us in chapter two. Okay. Um, the next couple of slides are talking about anemias uh, related to particular enzyme deficiencies causing those anemias. We're not gonna see those a lot of times in home care, but again, the goal here is to provide you the most accurate, current, and comprehensive list of information that you can um, save to your computer and reference and look at, um, or if you're still a paper person, print that out and have that for reference. Chapter three also gives us new codes for thrombocytosis um, for other and unspecified. Um, so thrombocytosis, for those that might not remember, is a disorder is in which your body produces too many platelets. Um, it can be reactive or secondary um, uh, with an underlying condition such as an infection. We'll see that a lot in COVID. And too many platelets can lead to certain uh, conditions such as stroke, heart attack, or um, a clot in the blood vessels. And you know, what are what have we been hearing about with COVID, but um, clots, microclots, um, heart attacks, um, increase of, you know, pulmonary embolism, DVT, and that type of thing um, as a complication of COVID. All right. Um, there is um, also a new code. It is called hereditary alpha uh, tryptosemia. And this um, is uh, hereditary alpha tryptosemia is a biochemical trait. People with this trait have an er inherited extra copies of this particular gene, and it increases levels of the protein detected in the body. 
Well, all of this has to do with the body's appearance. Uh, the more cells that you have or the more uh, genetic proponent or genes you have of this, it can make you um, have a propensity for an increased of a pro-inflammatory effect with your mast cells, such as something due to infection. And again, remember I said a lot of these things are coming um, out of the COVID um, symptoms and things that they're finding with that disease. All right, um, there um, uh, is another new genetic code, um, Newman Pick disease type A, B, um, not gonna uh, see a whole lot of that in the home care setting. So, uh, but again, I wanted to make sure you have that information. All right, chapter four, there were actually, um, the coding guideline updates, um, and this changes um, how we view, um, how we code medications that diabetes take. So before we're used to, um, you know, if they are, uh, and it hasn't changed with type one. Um, if type one insulin is inherent, we would not code insulin as a type one diabetic. But for secondary diabetes or type two, or if it's not listed, you know, we have the assumption that it's type two, then you're going to be assigning codes for every type of um, medication they're taking. If they're on insulin, assign the insulin. Um, of course, we know that that's as long as it's not short term to get their insulin under control. But if they're on routine insulin, routine hypoglycemic agents, or routine uh, injectable non-insulin diabetic medications, we would assign codes. And you could have potentially three codes um, for medications related to their diabetes. All right, we've got a new code for depression under chapter five, mental and behavioral health. Um, this category was revised um, so that we could now code uh, F32.A, depression unspecified. Now, the interesting thing on this is that um, it's strange that they have actually added an unspecified code to the code set. Um, however, CMS is actually implementing an edit for inpatient facilities on over 3,000 unspecified codes in April of 2022 um, that will have monetary penalties. Now, remember, anything that usually CMS begins to start with with inpatient facilities usually flows its way into the home care um, or hospice setting. And so just, just know that eventually down the line when we talk about, you know, it's best not to use an unspecified code, um, that it really is important uh, to know that. All right, we have a couple of new codes, F78.81 and F78.89. Um, and these are genetic, um, genetically related intellectual disability codes. And so I'll leave um, you to look at those. Uh, again, it's not something we're gonna use a whole lot of, but if we had that particular documentation, there are codes for that. All right, chapter five. So the main point I want to make about these updates, and they clarified wording on this first page, um, is that, uh, and, and let's go through this example because it will help you understand the um, the intent of these guidelines, the wording of these guidelines. I still think it gets confusing. So when you're doing coding and you see that someone has a medical condition um, related to substance abuse, uh, use, abuse, or dependence, however it's documented, and, um, you know, and they're not classified as substance-induced disorders, um, that you will assign the diagnosis code for the medical condition as directed by the alpha index, along with that psychoactive substance use, abuse, and dependence code. So in this example, you have alcohol-induced acute pancreatitis. Well, it would make sense that you would use you would think you would use the F10288 code that says alcohol dependence with other alcohol induced disorder. However, um, that is not the case. Alcohol dependence uncomplicated 
is what you are to use because they are stating that um, these medical conditions are not the ones they're referring to. They're actually referring to um, sleep disturbance, sexual disturbance, and other disturbances, uh, not medical conditions. Um, and you would not want to use the medical that code that links the two. All right. We talked earlier, there's a new code for being able to code the uh, blood alcohol level. Um, and so uh, this information was added to that specific guideline. And again, the provider must document the fact that they have an alcohol related disorder, just as they would have to document that they were obese or morbid obese for us to be able to document the BMI. But there is a new category for that. In our chapter six, diseases of the nervous system, there's new codes for acute flaccid myelitis. Um, and there's been an increase in recent outbreaks. Um, it's a neurological condition that causes um, body uh, reflexes in the body to become weak and uh, for lack of a better word, floppy after a respiratory infection. And then they also assigned a new code for cervicogenic headache. Um, and this is a type of secondary headache that um, <clears throat> it presents usually as a unilateral pain that starts in the neck. And it causes a lot of recurrent uh, common headaches. I was joking with somebody that I felt like <clears throat> this is probably because a lot of us sit in front of the computer all the time and that's what is causing those. All right. In chapter six, you'll also see G92.00. And on the next page, you'll see um, multiple codes. Um, <clears throat> and these are new codes. You might see this referred to as ICANS, and it's immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome. Now, what that is, it's because there's been an increase in immunotherapy with COVID. They've also seen some neurotoxicity syndromes, and it's graded from one to grade five. Um, five obviously being uh, the most, um, causing the most damage. And so later on, when we get to <clears throat> another category, we'll see the um, complication code uh, that is to go before this. So this is a manifestation code and it would be coded after that complication code when it was documented that there was this uh, neurotoxicity uh, related to that um, particular um, problem. We have a couple of other neurotoxic uh, encephalopathy codes. Um, and you know this is also not assigned to a clinical group uh, because there's an instructional note on both to code first. So you would need to code that first before you coded um, this uh, particular code. <clears throat> All right, we have a new chapter nine. Um, and if I don't mention a chapter um, at the end of our presentation, you will note that um, I have a slide that just denotes the chapters with no changes. Just so um, I'm, I tend to be a little neurotic about this, I guess every coder is, but just so that you're aware of what chapters did not have any changes. We have a new code, I5A, and this is for some type of uh, myocardial or heart injury that's non-ischemic and not traumatic. Um, and so <clears throat> it's based on, um, because of the increased uh, technology of our ability to have higher sensitivity uh, or higher sensitive troponin tests, clinicians can now distinguish whether or not it's a non-ischemic myocardial injury versus um, one of the other type of um, myocardial injury subtypes. And this is a manifestation code, so you would expect to see one of these um, other codes coded first before that code. All right, getting into chapter um, 11 of diseases of the digestive system, we have some new codes for esophageal polyps, and we have um, some new codes for gastric intestinal metaplasia. Uh, and that's just when uh, a, one cell um, turns from one type into another. You might see that, or you, that was dysplasia um, leading to irritation in the tissue before it develops into some type of uh, potential cancer. 
Chapter 12, Diseases of the Skin and Subcutaneous Tissue. Now, I am excited to have these codes. We are going to see these um, in the home care setting. This gives us the opportunity to be able to actually assign a code for patients that we know have breakdown due to fecal um, or urinary or dual incontinence. And it can be listed as primary if that is something that's um, a significant enough issue that the clinician is addressing that as the primary um, concern. Chapter 12, unstageable pressure ulcers. If during an encounter, if we find an unstageable pressure ulcer is revealed after debridement, we're only going to assign the code for the stage revealed following the debridement. Now this has been guidance, uh, been our guidance for one year from the coding clinic, but they really wanted to add these to the actual um, guidelines. All right, lots of new codes in chapter 13. Um, you'll see those there. We have several new codes for microangiopathy. Um, and <clears throat> um, it's talking about um, microangiopathies are this, a clinical syndrome that uh, causes hemolytic anemia. Again, from a lot of this, um, uh, it can be from a stem cell transplant or from other type of thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, so that's just interesting to be aware. If you've noticed anything in what we're talking about is the specificity at which they're moving ahead with some of this. It, it's just becoming um, imperative that we move through this um, information and that they understand we really have to be specific on the documentation and to get that. Chapter 13 gives us some great new codes for those of us um, who code Sjogren's syndrome. Um, it's really just a way to more specifically document uh, other involvement with these combination codes. And um, and not uh, and and take away the use of the SICA syndrome, which is really an outdated um, uh, way to refer to that diagnosis. All right, lots of codes on non-radial um, axial spondyloarthritis, and this is just a type of arthritis in your spine that causes inflammation. And the thing that's interesting here is the X-rays don't actually show damage to the joints. Um, it, but it's really the tissues that connect the bones to the ligaments. And so we have some new codes um, to look at that. You'll notice the unspecified sites does not have a group assigned, so you would get no reimbursement for that. And then all the other codes are going to fall into the musculoskeletal rehab. We have some new codes for back pain in chapter 13 as well. Um, we, uh, they've expanded that so we can have low back pain, unspecified vertebrogenic low back pain um, and uh, other low back pain. And none of these will be assigned to a clinical grouping, but we also know that we do see that a lot. Remember when you run into this situation and you see that the provider continually documents chronic pain along with this, um, and that's not something the clinician can determine. It has to be that approved provider. But chronic pain could be listed as primary, and then you could put, list this other low back pain um, if you had no other cause. All right, um, just one little change to the um, chapter 15, and I'm going to move on from that. Um, for those of you who might do um, obstetric nursing and home care, I wanted to put that there for you. All right, let's cover some new R codes. We've got R051 and um, acute cough, and you've got acute, subacute, chronic, uh, cough syncope, and other specified cough, and then cough unspecified. Again, remember, no group assigned for this. But CMS uh, wanted to expand these codes due to the pandemic because they were seeing different levels of cough um, and again, it's one of those things for them to be able to use this information as further research. You know, that's besides being a payment method, that's what our codes do is aid in research. So that's another reason it's really important um, that our data is complete and accurate. An acute cough is defined as less than three weeks. Subacute uh, resolves within three to eight weeks after treatment. 
and chronic cough is eight weeks or longer. Cough syncope um, is also called uh, laryngeal ictus, um, and that's really you have this paroxysmal cough, uh, facial congestion, um, it, which can lead to cyanosis or loss of consciousness. So be aware of that. We've got new codes for um, polyuria, nocturnal, and other. Um, they define nocturnal as overproduction of urine at night if you, based on uh, one third of your urine production within a 24 hour period occurring at night. Um, so I, I think it's interesting. I'm not really quite sure how they gather that, I guess, um, specific testing. All right, so um, we have a new code in chapter 18, R45.88, non-suicidal self-harm. And um, behavioral health is where this lies. And I know we don't do this a whole lot, but I wanted to bring your attention for those of you who might do psych nursing uh, in the home care setting that um, this was actually assigned to a primary clinical grouping. Now remember, we have no other R codes except for the dysphagia codes in the R13 series that can be used as primary. This, however, falls into behavioral health. Um, and so when you think of someone who has cutting issues um, or some other non-suicidal self-harm, then you would code also um, injury if known. All right, they've made, um, a, a created a new code. Um, it's unspecified coma, um, or they've actually uh, moved this code um, out of the, um, uh, it's not no longer part of the coma scale. And so uh, before, you know, the last update, we uh, we had kind of talked about, um, if you listen to the one that I talked about, that um, it clarified that you couldn't use a coma code except if it was some kind of traumatic injury, traumatic brain injury. Now they've what they've done is that um, they've taken this unspecified coma code and you can, um, you know, you're able to use this code um, if you, for any uh, medical condition, if you need it. And I, I really kind of think about our, if for those of you who might do hospice, that when you're looking for that code for somebody who has, um, you know, is no longer responsive and, and you know, kind of a comatose state, that uh, this allows us to use that code to show their mental status. Um, particularly, you know, maybe you have a patient that's, um, you know, in the inpatient unit or um, in that dying process. Okay, um, and then it just clarifies a little bit about the coma scale and when you would actually use those codes. All right, chapter 19 um, expands and gives us uh, two new subcategories. Um, and it gives us subcategories for poisoning by an adverse effect of underdosing of cannabinoids and um, of cannabis and synthetic cannabinoids. So, uh, or cannabinoids, I'm gonna say that incorrectly. Um, and so really it was expanded to allow the differentiating and reporting of poisoning adverse of cannabis versus synthetic. Um, and so there's multiple codes regarding poisoning, unintentional, self-harm, assault, uh, poisoning and determined, as well as adverse effect and underdosing. So, um, and obviously they, they all fender, fall under the MMTA, except for the adverse effect code, which we know we would uh, put a different code primary. Um, and just to say something about this, um, you know, if you're not aware of the, what they define as synthetic uh, cannabinoids are human made and they're obviously mind altering chemicals or molecules that bind to the same receptors um, to which the cannabis plants attach to. So um, lots of, of information on that. All right, chapter 19, here is our complication of immune effector cellular therapy. Uh, remember earlier when I said, okay, you have um, uh, a code that has to be coded secondary if they've had an adverse effect to some type of um, that immunotherapy drugs. And so then, um, you know, this is the code that would be primary. It falls into MMTA other, and then you would assign an additional code to describe the complication, um, such as one of those um, neurotoxicity syndrome, uh, that G92 codes. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of that um, at this point, but I think, again, as these new codes are out, we're gonna begin to see um, some of that clarification. 
All right, chapter specific coding guideline updates. You've got burns and corrosions, um, and they just did some um, cleaning up these guidelines. There's really no new guidance here. All right, so social determinants of health. This is really becoming a big deal. CMS has indicated that they want us to use as many codes um, as are applicable and documented by the provider, the clinician, or self-reported by the patient um, or uh, other family members if the clinician lists it within the medical record. In other words, she lists that information in her documentation, um, you know, such as, you know, the, uh, the you know, patient states, um, that they are having some type of lack of adequate food. Um, and so you don't, this does not have to be actually documented by the physician. And so, you know, they're going to be looking at these codes, social determinants of health. We're seeing this in a lot of our documentation. Um, I've begun to see it in medical um, documentation in like history and physicals. Um, most of it at this point is not filled out, but I, I do think, um, Further down the line, we're going to begin to see those, especially for those patients that have a social worker um, involved in that. All right. And then we've got some new codes for um, really giving us status codes um, regarding um, other things. And if you'll take note that there's one for um, gene therapy, personal history of gene therapy. Um, that we would have seen. Um, interesting, again, like I said, as we're doing a lot more of those type of therapies with um, the coronavirus research. All right, so in the guideline updates, they really talk about these social determinants of health um, and just reiterate that they really want us to use this information um, to complete a more, um, a better and more increased painted picture. Um, on this slide, um, it's actually slide 82, you'll see these different categories. And so they're subgrouped, um, you know, expanded throughout that, but you'll see um, a lot of information there in that. All right, remember I said chapter 22, codes for special purposes. Um, we have the post COVID condition unspecified. Um, and we talked about that earlier, what that code looks like. And they just actually put that code here. Um, I do want to mention that um, they consider post COVID conditions um, would, would be something new returning or ongoing health problems that they experience four or more weeks after first being infected. Um, so just be aware of that. And again, they just added some information in the guideline update as to where to see that, to refer back to that chapter one section. So there was some updated wording regarding a return code in your billing. So um, they just updated it. I thought it was interesting. It says the primary diagnosis is either not a reason for home health, period of care, or it is a manifestation code. So they put, a, you know, expanded that current description for um, that return code that you might see on that. All right, here is the slide on no changes and you'll see um, what we have there. Um, and I'm excited to say we have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes left in our presentation. So we will get to cover a little bit of the coding clinic updates. And so we'll just get through that as much as we can. Um, and um, again, you know, at the end, I would love your feedback. Um, I, I know this is a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, I'm not sure a better way to get you this information. Um, and um, <clears throat> but feel free to reach out um, via email. I think you have that in the um, in the slide presentation. And you're welcome to email me any specific questions, and I'll be happy to get back with you um, regarding that. Okay, I have a second. Hi, um, hey, Nanette, Mike. Yes, hey, Mike. Go ahead. If, if I could just uh, let you catch your breath just for a second, uh, we did. Thank have you. I thought you'd appreciate that. Uh, we did have one question come in and then just one thought on my mind maybe that you could um, expand on a little bit before you get into this section. But the question that came in was, uh, do you have to get a, a specific MD signed order to specify the code uh, used with these coding updates? Okay, 
And that's a great question. Um, so for those of you who might not have been clear, do we have to have a particular MD signed order to use some of these new codes? And so the, the answer is, is multifactorial. You would need to, of course, we cannot um, define any codes or apply those to the, um, you know, to our medical record for coding purposes, unless you have uh, documentation to support that. Usually this is from a history and physical. This is gonna be from a, um, some type of um, physician visit. Uh, and remember, you know, depending on what state you're in, you know, that could be potentially be a nurse practitioner or a PA if it's another approved provider. So you're looking for hospital stays, uh, physician visits, and that type of thing, uh, discharge summaries that are signed um, and verified by the physician. We, we would not be referring to like nursing home summaries um, where the medical records are not signed off by a physician um, or other approved provider. If in case you did have a patient that, let's just say they're a current patient and you know, um, you know that, uh, I'll just use an example of the depression code. If you were to use the depression code um, and you already had depression listed for the previous code and October 1st hits and you will get claim rejections for invalid codes, just know that that's gonna happen. Then if it matches, if it's an equal match, then you do not need to get an MD signed order because it's now the more appropriate code to use. And you would just change that code to the new code with an effective date in your record as of October 1st. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, it, it, I think it did to me. So I'm sure it did to the person who asked it too. Um, and then we just had another question come in, um, which probably dovetails with my thought too. And the question is um, in regarding to using unspecified codes as a primary diagnosis. And I, I think that kind of goes along with what I was thinking you mentioned the 31 new codes that are not assigned to any clinical group, those obviously can't be used as uh, primary diagnosis because of PDGM and they would be uh, ungroupable, but I'll let you speak to that more articulately than I can. Well, um, no, and you're, you're absolutely right about that. And, that. and that's what makes this a little bit difficult is, is just is knowing, knowing what to do for, and that's why I gave the example for, um, you know, if, you, if you've got a back pain and you have nothing else listed and no way to get further documentation from your provider, um, then you could use the chronic pain if it was documented by the physician. You would be surprised um, uh, how much more information you can get if you will ask, uh, because most people these days have more than one physician. You know, <laughs> I mean, yes, the primary physician is the one signing that plan of care. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use documentation from, um, you know, and I'm not talking about face-to-face -face requirements. I'm talking about just we're looking at medical records from different specialists. So don't be afraid to reach out to those specialists. Um, particularly, I think about CHF. Um, you know, there's just so much technology out there. Um, if you've got all these unspecified CHF, you really should be contacting, um, you know, those physicians. And I realize you have to protect your referral sources. You have people that don't want to be bothered, um, but it can be used as a great marketing tool to educate the physicians on uh, some of these new codes. Oh, you know, there's a new code for MI. Uh, while I'm here, I just wanted to see if there were any updates. Let me check with the billing office and see what codes they have on file. Oh gosh, we don't have that code. Could you send me an updated record um, of the last office visit? You know, it, it makes a difference in, in what you're doing and your practice. And we're going to have to be, begin to do that more and more as providers. So um, that was a very, um, I know I just built the clock, but that was a very long way to get you that information, but just to maybe help provide that because I, I understand I've been a director, I know what it's like to run an agency and um, doing all the many other things. And then you've added one more thing on there, but um, it's important. It's important. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll be quiet. Let you uh, wrap up in the <laughs> last few minutes here. So all great right. Job. Well, thank you. Good job. Thank you. And um, I, I again, we're not going to finish all this, but let's get through a few of these. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar, you know, the coding clinic is our is the coding world's authority, um, and they provide quarterly updates 
um, and clarify things with questions. And so it helps us have a better understanding of how to document things. So this first question on second quarter, and again, these are not all the updates, but these are the ones most relevant to home care. Don't pay attention to the five-year-old. Um, this would apply to regardless of the age. Um, the patient has epilepsy, um, has chronic static um, encephalopathy secondary to epilepsy and epileptic encephalopathy. Um, and so the deal is, is they're wanting to know is that static encephalopathy inherent to the epilepsy and not coded separately? And so it's interesting to me because in my mind, I would, you know, for those of us who might be nursing um, or other clinicians understand what happens in that post-ictal state, you would think that that would be inherently related. However, Coding Clinic has stated that you should assign other encephalopathy for chronic static encephalopathy and assign the code for the epilepsy. Um, and so even though it's linked, the provider has documented as a chronic condition, um, not just something that was a one time and you would code that. All right, so what is the appropriate code assignment for major neurocognitive disorder without behavioral disturbances when the under, underlying etiology is unknown or not further specified. Now, we know depending on the alphabetic index, however you look for that code, you can arrive at different code assignments, um, FO3 or FO150. And so they gave some uh, clarification on this, and they just said, you need to assign FO390 without behavioral disturbances, this is the unspecified dementia code, for a major neurocognitive disorder when the underlying condition is unknown or not further specified. And although this disorder is without behavioral disturbances, um, and although major neurocognitive disorder without behavioral disturbance is an inclusion term under FO150 vascular dementia, and then is in this case, the etiology is unknown and it wouldn't be appropriate to assign a code for vascular dementia. All right, so the next question was regarding a patient with secondary hypercoagulable state. So this patient has a history of paroxysmal AFib. They're on anticoagulant uh, maintenance. Does the provider need to link the hypercoagulable state with AFib? And so um, what they said is assign D68.69 for secondary hypercoagulable state. Um, and it's, it's specified to this code in the index. Um, and they're really an acquired disorder of thrombosis due to, due to complex and multifactorial mechanisms. Um, and that patients with AFib on chronic anticoagulant may have an increased incidence of this, but unless specifically documented by the provider, coding professionals should not assume the presence of a secondary hypercoagulable state in patients with AFib. Um, so in this case, um, although the provider did not link the hypercoagulable state to the AFib, um, the, uh, the secondary hypercoagulable state was documented by the provider. So you couldn't link it, as, um, but, you, um, but you could put it because that was documented. But you cannot assume that they are in a hypercoagulable state uh, because they're on a um, antithrombotic. Okay, patient was diagnosed. Oh, we've got a couple minutes, so I'm gonna do a couple more questions here. Um, patient was diagnosed with chronic bilateral subsegmental PE. Um, and there's separate sub entries for that. And so basically, what is the correct code for chronic uh, bilateral pulmonary embolism? And so it says uh, the coding clinic has said you need um, two codes, I26.94 um, and I27.82, both uh, to describe. Um, this condition. All right, let's run through these third quarter. We might actually make it. All right, a patient was admitted with anemia due to chemotherapy. They had previously received chemotherapy for primary um, AML, now in remission. Um, 
And so which condition should be sequenced as the primary diagnosis? Um, and so they stated that you're gonna be sequencing the anemia due to the antineoplastic chemotherapy as principal. And then of course, you're gonna assign the adverse effect of the immunosuppressant drugs and then the AML. Um, even though there's an excludes one node at category D64, uh, other anemias, remember an excludes one note that means cannot be coded here or you cannot code both of those at the same time. Um, this is a little bit different situation and both codes are required to capture that anemia due to the chemotherapy and the AML. And they're separate conditions and unrelated. And that's the key if you're running into an excludes one. All right, we have a patient who had chest pain, underwent a cardiac workup, including coronary angiography. The patient has known coronary artery disease and had multiple stents. Um, and so the stent re And so the question is really regarding um, in-stent re <clears throat> How would you code that? And it's actually coded as a complication of the stent rather than coronary artery disease. And so the, the goal of this question is to get you to understand that you need to always code restenosis of that stented artery as a complication unless the provider had documented as due to CAD um, or progression of um, the disease. Um, so be aware of that. So we have a stage three gluteal cleft pressure ulcer. And the person is asking, do we need two codes since really there's no code for a gluteal cleft pressure ulcer and it's kind of on the right and kind of on the left. Um, and so coding clinic stated, no, you would just use that one code, L89153 pressure ulcer on the sacral um, part of that. Um, all right, coming soon, um, probably in October of next year, um, our dementia codes are going to be updated and we're going to have to know, uh, I gave you the example of vascular, but there's going to be a lot of updates regarding every dementia code that we're going to need to have more information about their behavioral disturbances and some new codes on insulin resistance. So let me wrap this up. Um, always request records if there's no medical records to support the coding. Um, you cannot, uh, you cannot code anything suspected or stated by the patient without confirmation, um, except in the instances that we talked about, such as the social determinants of health. And ask for clear direction on the focus of care if it's not evident. Use your book or an appropriate um, online resource um, and read all the fine print. Certainly, if you do not um, do um, internal coding, if you don't code yourself, um, you, you know, or you use an outsource, you want to make sure that you have a process in place to do coding audits um, and finish up from there. So I apologize, we didn't have time for more questions, um, but that is all I have today, and I'll turn it back over to Access, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. I'm three minutes over, I apologize for that, um, but I hope this has been enjoyable for you today. Thank you, Nanette. Thank you both for sharing your expertise and wisdom with us. Don't forget, we will email everyone a link to the slides and video recording. For more resources, visit us at access.com or contact us to learn about our solutions. And I also encourage everyone to visit community.access.com. It's a place where you can connect, share information, learn, and grow. You'll get the latest updates and see more upcoming Access webinars posted there. Bye, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.